What's up, family? Thank you for tuning in to the Dream Nation podcast. My name is Casanova. I'll be your host, and I'm excited to be bringing to you entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and trailblazers from around the world. Stay locked in with us because we're about to go on a journey that will change your life. Have you ever heard of the toilet paper entrepreneur? What about how to profit first in your business? Well, if you have, then I can tell you, you probably know the man that's behind those books. But if you haven't, you're in for a treat. We have today on the show, my friend, Mike Michalowicz. He is a Wall Street Journal bestseller. And he also just wrote the book, Fix This Next. Now, it doesn't matter where you are in your business, whether you're just getting started, whether you're a seasoned entrepreneur, or whether you're looking to retire and, and maybe sell off and pivot into going into another area of business. In this episode, he talks about all of his ups, all of his downs, how he hired first, how he fired first, and also how he was able to sustain and help over thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs fix their businesses. So if you're in a position where you can sit down, take some notes, I would encourage you to do that because this one has so much wisdom in it that if you allow it, it will change your life. And that's my promise. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. What's up, Dream Nation? We are back again with another episode that I am sure will ignite and spark your entrepreneurial mindset to make your business healthier and your life wealthier. And so hopefully you stick around for all of this episode because I'm excited and I hope you are as well. Today on the line, we have my friend, Mr. Mike Michalowicz. Mike has been a successful entrepreneur and author. He's been featured in just about anything that you can think that is a, a successful mm -hmm. publication. But where I first found him was through a book called The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. And so I want to start there because out of all of the success that you've had, you have been the, what would I say, the advocate for that toilet paper entrepreneur. So for anybody who does not know who you are, yeah. give us the background on who is Mike Michalowicz. Casanova, thanks so much for having me, first of all. Who I am is nowadays, I'm an author, author guy for small businesses, but I've been an entrepreneur my entire adult life. And uh, somewhere it was interesting as hearing your story. I had an early start on adult life right after college. I had my first son and I was, I was married in my very early twenties and decide, Hey, I got a great idea. Let me start a business. And uh, holy crap, is it hard? <laughs> is it hard to run a business? And I got thrown into it. And we were living in this, this little uh, apartment. We actually, it's funny, we moved into a retirement building because the, the rent was cheap, but we were the only people like under age 80 in our building. And we were there living off peanut butter and jelly and ramen soup. And that's how we got started. I, I fell in love though with the entrepreneurial journey and uh, decided in later phases of my life that I'm going to write and, and help th this community, particularly what I call the toilet paper entrepreneur, that's how that book came around is, is th there's a certain scrappy community of entrepreneurs, uh, not the ones that you see on the cover of all the magazines, super famous guy, super famous gal, but, but these entrepreneurs that are just hustling and getting out there every day to move their business forward, but are doing it smartly, not just, not just grinding it out, they're, 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 they're being strategic. I wanted to give those underdogs the opportunity because I, I felt that that was that was my people, that was my community. So I, I write books for that. My, I've written now six or seven books. Profit First is, is my most popular, my most recent Fix This Next. And I'm, I'm hustling away right now and writing another book. Wow. And so one of the things that I love about it is how you break these down into one, bite-sized pieces, but two, you also have practical strategies behind it. Like in most of all of your books, at the end, there's two or three takeaways and yeah. action points for people to do. And when you talk about the toilet paper entrepreneur, I think the story that really made that resonate with me was when you were saying, hey, have you ever been sitting down in the toilet? And, right. then, and then you all of a sudden you look over and you only got three sheets. Right. right. You got to survive through that. And I think that that is relevant to today's world. And it shows you how evergreen that that content is because it came out, I would say, what, 2014, 2013? The book, I, I probably even before, I think 2008 was, I don't even wow. remember. I think it was 2008. So my, it was my first book. Yeah, it's funny. So all of us have been stuck on the can. That's something you can't deny. We've all been stuck there. And no one, I give up, my life is over. You see those three sheets there. 
and you find a way. People have emailed me telling me their strategies. I really don't want to hear them, but we navigate it. Well, in business, we, we find that we're in the same situation, but what's interesting is in both the scenarios, we get very innovative. We figure out what to do. So in business, entrepreneurs say, well, I don't have enough money to get started. That's not true. You don't need money to get started. There's an innovative way of doing it. In fact, the lack of money forces you to be creative. And that's the power of entrepreneurship. Some people say, I don't have the experience. I've never done this before. You were talking about your friend who started that cleaning business. A lot of people wouldn't start a clean business because they've never had been in the cleaning business. But ironically, by not having a cleaning business, you don't know the rules of the industry. So you break the rules and you find better ways to do it. Mm -hmm. And you can actually grow explosively because you don't know the way it should be done. Why teach in a toilet paper entrepreneur? In every case where we have a lack of education, a lack of experience, a lack of money, a lack of contacts, in every single case, that can be an extraordinary advantage. Mm. I would definitely agree. And what we come to find is like when our backs are up against the wall is when we really see who we are. And we really don't, we, we stop to, because in the beginning, I would think that most people, the reason why they don't get started on things is what we know is procrastination. Sure. And, and at the same time, it's a lot of fear. But at that time when you're stuck and you only have those three sheets of toilet paper, yeah. you, don't, you don't care. And it's, it, I think there was another thing that you had said. I think it was a video that I was watching, but you were talking about if someone comes up to you and you, they put a bag over the back of your head, and then all of a sudden at that moment, all you want to do is breathe. And, and so I think that that's very relevant because right now there's a lot of people that all they want to do is breathe. And so my question to you is, first off, as you've wrote all these books, and I want to tackle on each one of them just a little bit, which book do you think that has made the most impact? Because you wrote Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, which was great. You also wrote Profit First, but then you also have Fix It Next, right? Yep. That's my most recent. And so fix, as you've looked at these- yeah. What, what's been the most impactful? Is there any of these books that you thought, man, I didn't think that it would take off this way? Um, well, Profit First has exploded. It's translated now, I think, in 20 plus languages. I get calls from throughout the world. Like right now, as we're sitting here, I'm just curious. I'm, I'll put my email. As I'm sitting here, I bet you emails have come in. People are emailing me constantly about it. One came at 1210, so it's 1212. Hmm. So from Crystal Thurber, <laughs> if she's listening in, email me and says, hey, about your book. That used to be surprising. Now I'm so used to it. Emails come in every few minutes. That book, I, I didn't really think that Profit First was that big of a deal outside the U.S. alone. There's, a, there's 30 million small businesses. So if you do less than $25 million in annual revenue in your business, I absolutely do, you're qualified as a small business. So we, we're, we're in the same bucket. I didn't really think about the international scope. There's 300 million small businesses globally. And this problem with profitability is not a U.S. problem. It is a global entrepreneurial problem. So I, I just didn't expect that global expansion. I, I, just before uh, I came on here, I was doing a, a, a video chat with some folks in Mexico talking about their profitability. Um, so that was, that's a wonderful surprise. The, the book, I think, that has the greatest impact is Fix This Next. And why it's having the greatest impact is so many entrepreneurs – we, we, when we go in for the day's work, we, we have a vision or plan we want to achieve that day. But within minutes, email and all these questions and challenges present themselves, we never get our vision done. It, it seems like we're just constantly grinding away and, and putting out fires. Fix This Next is a tool I developed to avoid that. The, mm. the biggest um, roadblock to growing our business to our vision is not the customer opportunity. It's not uh, the way we're marketing. It's not our effort by any stretch of imagination. It's the distraction. It's the doing everything. If, if we just nailed the one thing our business needs from us every day, day in, day out, do the one thing our business needs, we crush it. And there's only one thing. I use an analogy like, it, Cass, if you and I had a, a chain between us, and, we're, and the game of this, this thing is, is to snap the chain at some point, it doesn't matter what you and I do. You could put all the strength into it and yank it, or I could give you some slack and try to pull it back. But it will always break the same spot, which is the weakest link. Mm. A chain is only as strong as the weakest link. Our business is only as strong as the weakest part. But what we're doing every day, putting out fires, all these apparent things, we're trying to fix all the chain links. And then we get frustrated that the business keeps on breaking at the same spot. Why aren't we progressing? The reason is we're fixing all the chain links when we only need to fix the one weakest. And if we concentrate our energy there and fix it, 
the entire chain is now stronger because that mm -hmm. weak link has been resolved. Fix this next, I wrote, to identify the weak link in your business. That's why I think it's probably the most impactful book I've written. Yeah, and I would definitely agree. I think that we all have those same struggles. Do you think that a lot of the times it could be cured with finding someone else who capitalizes on your weakness? or where? Because you've helped thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of business owners. Why do you think so many people struggle with identifying and then actually putting the action behind fixing that weakest link? Yeah, so the, the reason I think we we constantly stay in that struggle is there is a reward for doing that. And it's a quick dopamine hit in our brain in that when you finish off that email, you respond to that customer, or you make that quick little sale here where you save that situation. Hey man, just took care of that. Right. Awesome. I feel good. All right, let me go into the next thing. And then we get that dopamine hit again, 15 minutes later, because we tackled the next little micro issue. So the reason we stay stuck in this is there's rewards constantly. If we just answer those emails and do those things, the, the, the solution um, is, is, is focusing on the long-term impact. We really gotta actually put pain associated with fixing small problems. And here's the one way to do it. Look at your business history. And if you've been putting out fires, hustle and grinding for more than a year, you've proven, and your business isn't moving forward in a big way, you've proven that's not the way to move the business forward anymore. Mm. The way to do it is bring in outside experts for sure. But really the starting point is with us ourselves. We have to have a true analysis of what are we great at and what do we do just because it's necessary. If we move to our greatness, we will excel. And what we have to do to do that is start removing the, the stuff that we're just good at and are doing because it's required of us. I encourage every entrepreneur, I don't care if you're just started yesterday or if you've been in business for many years, get a personal assistant, get someone they don't have to be full time. They can work a few hours a week for you in the beginning, a virtual assistant or some sort. But get the, the little low kind of necessary work, but distracting work off your plate. Maybe it's, it's getting those invoices out or responding to customer service requests or, or just getting supplies for the office. But get that stuff off of your plate. The benefit isn't just the relief from not doing this stuff anymore. Is we'll start learning the ability to assign tasks to other people. So many entrepreneurs fall in the trap. Like I'm the best at this. No one can, no one can do as well as me. I'm the best. No, no, you're not the best. Other people are really good at those little micro elements. That we got to start peeling you away, allowing you to focus on your true talents, which may be selling or maybe delivering the service. But ultimately the ultimate business has no dependency on you. What's fascinating about this. And, and I've been lucky enough to afford, I own multiple businesses. I've achieved this. My businesses don't need me. They run without me. They grow without me. And when you get to that point, then as a business owner, you have the right to reinsert yourself in the business in ways that just give you joy. And mm -hmm. for me, there's two things I just love to do. I love writing books. So that's what I do half the day. And I love being the spokesperson for the book's ideas. So that's what we're doing right now. But that's all I do for my business. The business runs itself. We, we get there by slowly peeling ourselves out and inserting other people, systems and technology to support what we remove ourselves from. Wow. Do you think that you can build a hundred million dollar company? Let's even bring that down and let's even say a million dollar company. Do you think that you could build a million dollar company without having systems in place that allow you to get there? I, I, and the reason why I ask that is because a lot of people who are listening to this right now, they're an aspiring entrepreneur and they have that same mentality that really they want to be an entrepreneur, but they're a solopreneur. And something that one of my coaches said to me, which is what you just said, if you don't have an assistant, you are the assistant. And so my question to you is, as you've looked at all of these different business plans and, and balance sheets for other businesses, have you seen anyone that's gotten there without having the proper systems in place? Yes, yeah, maybe shocking. Yes, you can grow a hundred million dollar company with no systems or a million dollar company, especially if it's a single sale. If I, if I put a piece of jewelry in front of you, I, I'm a jewelry salesperson. I put it down and you have a hundred million dollar check. And I said, this huge diamond here is a hundred million dollars and you buy it from me. I slide across the table. I just had a hundred million dollar a year for my business, but I have no systems and no process. I say you can't build a healthy business without systems. So revenue, honestly, is a vanity metric. I, I used to be very impressed when someone achieved a million dollars in revenue. I'm like, wow, that's a big deal. Or 5 million. I grew my one business to 7 million. I'm like, look at me. And then I realized it's just vanity. It doesn't matter. It's just that people are willing to put money, but it flows right through my business. 
-hmm. What matters is how much of that money can I extract repeatedly with the least effort? And that's where systems come into place. If Listen, I'm really impressed by a company that's a $100,000 business where the owner's taking home $90,000 and sitting you know, on the porch just enjoying drinks in the middle of the afternoon on a Tuesday. That's impressive. How did you get that, that you can right. make money on automatic with no active effort on your behalf? That comes about through systems. So you can't achieve a healthy business without systems, in my opinion. That's absolutely mandatory. No, and, and I love it. And I wanted somebody else to be able to hear it from an expert because I believe the same thing. My next point that I think that people are wondering is say, okay, I understand I need systems in my business, but I struggle with the piece that you already mentioned, which is delegation. Did you ever struggle with this delegate? Because it's easy to say, okay, I'm going to hire somebody to do these things. But of course you have your own particular way that you want them done. And then all of a sudden you say, you know what, in the time that it took me to tell that person how to do it, I could have just did it myself. Did you ever struggle with that? And if so, what was your solution to coming out of that to being able to delegate more efficiently? Fuck yes, I struggled with that. My God, yeah, my God. You know, I didn't even know what delegation was. Hmm. I, I thought, I thought delegation, say we work together, Casanova. Say you're my boss. I thought delegation was you give me something to do, do invoicing, and I come back and say, hey boss, got a couple questions. You tell me the answers. And finally it's done. I'm like, here you go, it's done. I thought that's delegation. No, delegation is not the assignment of tasks. It's the assignment of outcomes. Here's the mm -hmm. other scenario. You're my boss. You come to me and say, hey, Mike, I need you to do invoicing. And I say, okay. And then you say, but hold on. There's a reason behind this. We need to bill our clients timely and accurately. Do you understand why, Mike? And I'm like, yeah, timely is fair to us. We collect money. Accurately is fair to our customers. Great. Your job, Mike, you, the outcome we need to achieve is to bill timely and accurately. So then I go and I start doing the invoicing. I come back. I'm like, hey, Cass, I got a question for you. Am I, you're like, mm -hmm. What's your solution to get us to do this timely and accurately? Delegation mm. is the assignment of the outcome and requiring the employee to achieve that on their own device, not to come back and keep asking questions. That's why I thought delegation was, was assign a task, answer the questions and direct. No, delegation is the assignment of outcomes and hold the employee accountable to it and empower them to do that. There wow. was a study uh, conducted, and I'm not sure the source, but it was probably SBA identified that I think it's 95% of small businesses uh, have three employees or less. And the whole reason is, is the boss man is making all the decisions. Everyone else does their little tasks. And they come back and say, did I do it right, sir? Did I do it right? And then the boss is like, no, yes. We are one brain, the boss, controlling all these different hands. That is not scalable. The brain can mm -hmm. only process so much. So true delegation is the assignment of outcomes, empowering employees to to tackle the outcome, and when they face challenges, to navigate themselves. That's what we need to do. And delegation Man. is absolutely mandatory. I struggled with that, and now I finally have that process down. Yeah, no, and I, I love that you said that. There's so many nuggets and gems in there, and I did just learn something new again, and it's about managing the outcomes because I think we all want to be able to free up our time, but that's how we think is at a surface level that it's about the task. And I'll tell you, there's one video that I saw, and it was of Jeff Bezos, and this was probably three or four years ago that he was on a panel, and someone asked him about what his day, his morning routine looks like. And he says that he doesn't basically do anything that's intense, you know, for the brain before 11 o'clock. But more importantly, he had said, if you think about it and you're a high level executive, you're a CEO, CFO, whatever it is, you're really only paid to make two to three high level decisions every single day. Mm. But we get into this that we got to do emails, we got to put out these fires. I know that you have a, a, a term called happenstance, that all these things just happen to me and, and, and things yeah. like that. So I think that that's so critical and that's so valuable for you as you've now created so much success for your businesses and helped other people create success. What's the one thing that still keeps you up at night? Very little, very mm. little. I'll tell you, it's interesting. Once, once we as individuals achieve financial security and, and have the freedom to do what we want, when we want personal freedom, there's very little that keeps me up as in worry. I don't worry much at all, but what does keep me up is, is actually this I have on my wall is my mission to eradicate mm. entrepreneurial poverty. Every day, every night, I think about that. As I go to bed, that is what's on my mind. Entrepreneurial poverty is this gap that's happening. There's this 
this belief but the day you start your business you're like, i'm gonna be rich and i'm gonna change the world and things are gonna be amazing and then you get into it and it's like i have no money i'm working my ass off this gap is what i call entrepreneurial poverty this, this perception we want the world to see and the reality every night i go to bed thinking about that every day i'm thinking about that so it's it's cool because it's not it's not worry i'm not worried for myself i'm worried for our society i'm worried for you and me and all entrepreneurs if we struggle and i gotta fix that so there's this it's more of a positive energy. We got to drive this forward. We got to be profitable and successful. All entrepreneurs. That's what keeps me up. But it's just weird because it's not a worry in the traditional sense. Like I'm worrying about me. I got a mission to take care of. That's what's keeping me up. Got it. And in most spaces, I think it for a lot of people, it's, it's just, it's not as niche down as you are. You're talking about the things that many might consider boring, right? Why don't we look at our taxes? Why don't we look at our balance statements and all these things? Some people might consider it boring. For you, do you feel like that it ever becomes anxiety or exhausting because there's not a lot of people in your space that are teaching what you're teaching to business owners? Yeah. Yeah. They're, 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 yeah. Yeah. Profit first, right? dig into the finances. And uh, there's not many people that are talking about it particularly in the way I talk about it. So there are some experts who go into the technical elements and try to dig in deeper and deeper. But that's just like, like the high school class where the, the teacher is like teaching chemistry or something and you're like, oh my God, I can't handle this. And right. the solution is let me jam it down your throat more. And they're yelling it at you. That does not fix things. We have to find an alternative path. Is there a different way we learn? Is there a, a fun way we learn? Is there a way that already works with how we already behave? Here's an example. Like I, I want to work out regularly. I've always wanted to work out regularly and I always have sporadically I go to the gym for a few months. And I give up for a year and I'm back well, five years ago, or maybe a little longer, eight years ago, I haven't missed the gym once. I go five days a week, every day. The changing point was not by I'm going to commit to this and finally just you know, power through it. The changing point was noticing my behavioral pattern. What I noticed is when I wake up in the morning, First thing I do is I go to the bathroom, I walk, I make a cup of coffee, I drink coffee, I start reading the paper, and I'm like, oh gosh, I'm late for work, and I don't go to the gym. Well, I noticed the first thing I did was wake up and go to the bathroom. There's an opportunity for what I call a behavioral intercept. If my behavior is go to the bathroom every single time, I can make the gym intercept it. What I would do is I put my gym shoes on top of my toilet seat. So when I'd walk into the bathroom, the only way I can use the toilet is by grabbing my gym shoes. Now I'm like, oh, just put on my feet. I put them on, I'm like, oh, let's go to the gym. And it started this pattern. Mm. So I teach in profit first and around financials is not, you don't have to learn any accounting. In fact, screw the accounting. We hate it, ignore it. But what we all do is we log into our bank account to see if any money's come in. So profit first, I intercept that behavioral path of logging to the bank account and set up accounts there so you know what money's coming in for what purpose. Mm. Some of it's to pay for your profit, some is to pay you, some is to reserve for taxes, others to pay bills. So we know what the money's intended use is. And since it intercepts what we already do, now we don't need to change. Sadly, there's some people out there that say, oh, you know, this system that Mike has, this profit first system, you can do it in a spreadsheet. You can't because that's not our behavioral path. Mm. You know, there's a thing called an accounting system. How many entrepreneurs log into their accounting system and do all this analysis before they write out that check for that new computer equipment? Most of us don't. We no. simply log into the bank and say, hey, I got some money today. Let me buy that computer equipment. So if our natural path is to go to the bank, then we have to have the system that sits at the bank to intercept that behavior. Got it. Let me ask you, how much do you see that people risk? Because I'm sure when you get to see the backside of the financials of a business, many people are in debt to get the business even off the ground in the beginning. Are you, do you, are you a proponent of that? Or are you somebody, since you come from the analytical standpoint, that you say, hey, make sure that you extract everything that you could do without having to go to a bank um, and get a loan or something like that? Yeah, de debt is so misused by entrepreneurs, including myself. When I took on debt, I didn't understand what it is. There's three forms of debt um, there, and, and we don't understand what they are. So the first is called debt leveraging. It's a term that some people are familiar with and they say they're doing it, but they're not. Debt leveraging, say, say I wanted to do debt leverage. I go to you and say, hey, Casanova, could you give me you know, some money? Can I have a dollar? And if you lend me a dollar, if I know within, say, one month, I'll get $2 back from that dollar, that's debt leveraging. Debt leveraging is where I know there's going to be a specific increased return within a specific time period. Then I can say, well, that makes good sense. I borrow a dollar from you. I make those $2. 30 days later, I come back and say, here's your dollar plus interest, and I made money. 
Okay. That's debt leveraging. Almost no one does that, yet they say they're doing it. The second one's called debt bridging. Debt bridging is I'm running my business and all of a sudden there's a slowdown in sales, I meaning there's less money co coming in. There's a cash flow situation. If I have bills I need to pay, like payroll or something, but I know within a few weeks, cash flow will be flowing again. A big client is going to be sending a check. That gap of time, that valley, we can bridge over with debt. Now I borrow a dollar from you and say, thanks for that money. I use it to pay payroll. And then after that two weeks, when that big check comes in, I say, here's your dollar back plus interest. I can continue business as normal. Right. There's a third form of debt. And this is what almost everyone does. It's called debt anchors. Debt anchors where I say, hey, Casanova, can I borrow a dollar? And you're like, for what reason? I'm like, to grow my business. And you're like, okay, here's a dollar. I'm like, okay, let me get some new furniture. Or, or you know what? I really should have a nice car because that'll impress people when I pull up in my Mercedes. Or, or no, 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 no. I need the nicest office space on the planet. Or I got one of those Facebook ads. That is, it's not calculated. And now we've received funds and we're arbitrarily doing things and we're back justifying emotional decisions. Like I want to drive a nice car or have a nicer office space or have a great looking website. We justify that by saying that's going to attract customers and it doesn't. And now it's an anchor. Now I have this money that I'm paying you interest just to maintain, but I can never pay back the principal and I'm screwed. So my rule of thumb is no debt. Just find a way to achieve the results you want to achieve without spending anyone else's money except for your own uh, and try to spend no money whatsoever. Screw, screw the office space. Does anyone really visit your office anyway? Does it really freaking matter what other people think? Screw the car. Screw it. Let's just master this business. And, uh, and you'll be very successful. It, it's funny. I, I found there's something interesting in poker. I, I play every so often. And I found there is a parallel between poker and humanity. When someone is, is bluffing at the table, what that means is they have a weak set of cards and they're trying to scare everyone else off the table by acting big and throwing down money and splashing the pot. Conversely, when someone has a strong hand, that's when they're like, mm, they play meek. They're like, ah, oh, no big deal, right. you know, whatever. Uh, I'll ha I guess I'll stay in. And you know, that person's got the strong cards. Well, in life, I found the same thing. The person that needs to show success is often weak. Those are usually the weakest businesses, the ones that have all the great effects. And look at how amazing my business is and look at the results. It's usually, uh, it's just bluffing. Right. Conversely, it's the business owners that are like, hey, things are cool and I'm here to be of service. And they're just totally humble, meek, who are the most successful. So there's an interesting parallel about how we use money in poker and debt in this case too. Yeah, no, I, it, it's so great. And here's what I heard off of that. The first one I, I thought about really um, because you talked about debt leveraging what we think about. And so it's like using hard money loans to get like real estate. The second one was debt bridging. And that could be something like 401ks, right? Things like that, where then you pay it back. And then the last one is really like credit cards. And so again, I get what you're, you're saying on all of them. I, am I correct on that? That those could be yeah, associated? I mean, yes, with a little tweak. It doesn't matter what the source is. So your know, debts can come borrow from your 401k or from credit card or a bank. But it's really not the source. It's the application, meaning how we use that debt. Debt leveraging is where there's a guaranteed upside return. Most people don't calculate that. Debt mm -hmm. bridging is where you cover a gap in time where you need cash flow, but you can return the money. Debt anchoring is just where we borrow money, and it could be from the 401k or credit cards, but we don't have the ability to pay it back or we don't plan for it. And that's where most people fall. Yeah, no, I'm glad you clarified that. And I'm sure someone got some wisdom out of it and hopefully a solution for their business of how they cannot keep going down that rabbit hole. Let me ask, where do you get your, do you consume a lot of other information? Where do you get your inspiration from? Because it feels oh, like you know your path. Constantly. Yeah, so I love to read. I was reading this morning. I have a routine now. I get up 5.30, the latest I'll ever get up is six in the morning, but usually 5.30 and I'll spend about a half hour just reading so this morning I was reading about P.T. Uh, Barnum, the founder of Barnum Bailey Circus. Yeah. It's interesting entrepreneurial stories. And I listen to Audible. So then when I hit the gym, I'm listening to Audible. So I get another hour uh, or so of listening into a book. In. Uh, and then I'm really, my favorite part is I'm so blessed. I get to interview tons of people for my own books. Yeah. So I was just interviewing actually this woman named Melinda Emerson last night. She's a uh, expert in the entrepreneurial space. And the day before I was talking to this guy who owns a baseball team and how he's operating it. And I start hearing, I call them common threads. Like you hear different stories from different people and at certain points like, Oh, I see the same pattern playing out that drives the same result. Take hmm. note of that. That could be it uh, for me or for a book I'm writing. So those, that's how I learn. And, and I love to learn constantly. It requires 
curiosity. And I think if, if we are curious, we will find amazing solutions right in front of us. Yeah, absolutely. Just a couple of things left. And I want to say thank you. This has been phenomenal. The first is, as you look at your journey, a lot of people see it and it looks like you have it all figured out now. If you can go back in your 20 years of really teaching entrepreneurs, maybe even more than that, and you can look at the one thing that you could have done to accelerate your path of making your dream a reality, what would be that one thing? The first thing that comes to mind is diversity. What I mean by that is the more I've learned from other entrepreneurs, men, women, uh, people that have come from impoverished backgrounds to wealthy backgrounds, different learning experiences, different religious beliefs. It's interesting. The more I explore outside of my paradigm of what I know, I, I've discovered more and more strength in, the, in that learning. So I would encourage myself to seek more diverse learning as opposed to more narrow. That would have been very helpful in expediting my growth and, and success. Wow. And, and that's an interesting concept because it seems like you have been always a specialist in the way that you've done things. And now it feels, and, and you particularly, when you talk about the one thing and then the finances, but now yeah. do you find yourself becoming more of a generalist? This is ironic. So my books I, I are pretty broad, right? So I'm speaking to different categories of entrepreneurship, but the businesses I own, are more and more narrowly focused consistently. I'm trying to refine it. The riches are in the niches. There's no question about it. So we must be absolute specialists. It's better to be the brain surgeon. They make a lot of money than the general practitioner who's struggling to pay off their student debt. Mm. But when it comes to learning, diversity is important. So specificity and growth, diversity and learning. Wow. Great way to put it. Great way to put it. There's somebody out there. And well, before we ask this last question, I want to know, you've interviewed thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs and, and people that have been thought leaders. Has there been one that has stood out to you that you maybe didn't think that's had a, a significant impact on your mindset um, and your growth? Yeah, quite a few. One comes to mind uh, is a guy named Jesse Cole. He's the owner of the baseball team. I was just talking to him a few days ago. I've interviewed him now, I probably think six or seven times. He, he started a, a baseball team called the Savannah Bananas. It's a mm. minor league team. It is an unbelievable story. If you get a chance to Google them, it's unfreaking believable what they You talk team. about a story in your book. Right? Yeah, and I, and I write about him. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm okay. so intrigued by their progress, um, particularly now, like with this COVID crisis, you can't have baseball games. The major leagues, you don't even have attendance. They're, getting, they're, they're packing the stadium still within the law. Uh, of separation and so forth. The guy is extraordinary in drive and innovation. So I just, I'm just, I, I love speaking with him because I learned so much from him. What's the number one thing you've learned from him? To, to be different, that to be part of the, to, to play into what the community is like already, to, to be more of the same, even if you're better, it's invisible. But if, if you're bold and you're different, you'll get noticed. And just as an example, I met him face to face at this conference and uh, I'm outside and there's this guy walking. You can't help but notice him because it's a big city and there's this one guy walking in a yellow tuxedo, head to toe, walking down the street. And people are like looking at this guy. It's Jesse Cole. And he walks up, he sits down and like, hey, are you Mike? I'm like, yeah, like, first time we met face to face. He bleeds being different, everything mm -hmm. about him every aspect of his business and you cannot not notice, but it's all genuine. It's not like he's just, he's putting on this big facade. So people pay attention. He gets your attention and then you fall in love with his business and what he does. Cause it's so impressive. God, I love it. It's like when my broker would say, when I first got into real estate, he, he would always say money flows to the difference, not to the similar. You right? love that. Yeah. So it's, it, it's goes right to your point. The last thing that I want to ask is there's someone out there that's watching this right now, listening to this right now, and they're super inspired by you, your journey, and they want to blaze a path similar to what you've done or at least having a healthy business. But they have that little voice in their head and that little voice says that they're not strong enough, they're not smart enough, or maybe they just don't have enough resources. What's the one thing that you would say to that person to get them to just take action? Yeah, we got to go through a quick reframing and say, I'm so happy that I don't have enough money. I don't have enough resources. I don't have enough experience. Just by saying, I'm so happy that it forces our subconscious mind to start saying, why am I so happy that? Oh, because without money, 
I have to sell and I have to go to people that don't even know me to sell, which will prove out my concept. That's right. Mm -hmm. I got to be able to sell to strangers. That's better than having the money in the first place because I'll prove my idea is good. I, I don't have the network or the experience. Well, freaking great because now you're going to break the rules. You're going to define a whole new community. You don't need a network because you're going to be creating one. So whatever the negative frame is, I don't have, start off with, I'm so happy that, dot, 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 I don't have in our mm. subconscious mind, we'll start actually making that a win for us. Man, I love it. Out of all of the, I mean, we've had 150. No one has said that. I've, we've heard some great, great techniques and tactics, but no one has said that. Great way to mic drop. Hey, my brother, <laughs> I want to say that this has been phenomenal time with you. For anybody that wants to stay connected, we're going to make sure that we put all of the links to all of your books in the show notes. But for anybody who wants to stay connected with you, where can they find you at? I'll give you two, two ways. MikeMichalowitz.com. No one can spell that, so don't even try. Go to Mike Motorbike, as in the motorcycle. MikeMotorbike.com. It's one of my nicknames, the safe nickname I had in high school. And uh, all my resources are there, all the books, chapter downloads. I have my own podcast called Mike Up In Your Business. It's all at mm -hmm. MikeMotorbike.com. Got it. I'm excited to hear the feedback on this one. I'm sure there's going to be more emails in your inbox here in a couple of weeks saying, hey, I love it. heard you on Email. the Dream Nation podcast and this is how you've changed my business. So remember Dream Nation, just as he said, you have to reframe it so then you can take action because without it, even though in the dream we trust with no action, it's only a fantasy. So we'll see you on the next one. That's all we got for this episode. Thank you for sticking around. That truly means a lot to me. And hopefully that means that we delivered massive value on this one. If you haven't already, the way that you could say thank you to myself and the team is just by heading over to iTunes and leaving a review and a rating. That's what iTunes loves to see. That's how we get out there even more. And I would definitely, definitely be grateful for it. I know the team would as well. Do me a favor and head on over to dreamnationpodcast.com. That's where you're going to be able to find all of the resources that we talked about in today's episode, as well as more exclusive content. And you'll also be able to sign up to our email list where we have more exclusive content. And we always love to hear the feedback from you all because you're our tribe. So remember, in the dream we trust, we'll see you on the flip side.